Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. Good to see you all, so excited. A couple of people bouncing in, I'll just let that all continue to happen. We'll be beginning in just one minute. Okay, I think everyone, oh no, it's still coming in. For those who've just joined us, I'm just waiting for the rest of the uh, names to pop up on the list so we make sure that everyone's included. We'll begin in 30 seconds. Okay, no worries. Still popping in. Okay, we might begin now. Um, it is recorded, so no one will miss out. But um, hi, my name's John. I'll be the host for you today, uh, tomorrow, yesterday. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm not sure where you are. Uh, I'm in Australia and it's early in the morning. So welcome to today's work webinar of Universal Principles of Great Communication. This conversation began about, uh, I don't know, Earlier last year, where I was doing some work for Girls in Tech in Macau, um, we did a little conversation communication effectiveness workshop there for their uh, inaugural summit and went extremely well. And so it seemed like a natural progression when COVID-19 happened that we would continue this conversation with people online and get it to many, many more people. Um, I've always supported um, a lot of youth and diversity groups. And so for me, it became really important more recently uh, I have a daughter and it, it occurred to me that she might not have the same opportunities that I do because of her gender. And that impacted me quite, quite significantly. And um, when I researched it a little bit more, I realized that not only were diverse groups more creative, they are more financially viable. They have a higher success rate. They have a higher satisfaction ratio and economically, an organization does significantly well. And I thought, well, surely the simplest thing we can do to create the best opportunity and upside for everyone involved at a national level, at a personal level, at an organizational level was to support more women in strategic roles within an organization. So that's kind of my little bit of history there. Um, I just heard that I'm losing a bit of audio. Are other people kind of having that problem? If so, Maybe mention something in the chat and I'll, I'll kind of keep an eye on that. Okay, maybe, maybe it's just me, just, just double checking. Um, yeah, so that, that was kind of the scenario. So it, it occurred to me that if this, this small thing can make such a massive difference, then why wouldn't we do that? And so that became a very much part of a bigger part of my um, uh, modus operandi, if you want to call it that. And I, you know, I happened to meet Adriana, who's the founder of um, Girls in Tech, and um, we connected instantly and here we are. It's been, been a wonderful journey and a wonderful experience and everyone I've met has been absolutely fantastic. I might give you a bit more context in terms of my background and how I ended up here. Um, I was an IT guy many, many years ago. And for those of you who remember what the Millennium Bug was, which is pre-2000, um, there was a situation because I was an engineer, I was a lowly engineer, and uh, there was no such thing back then as a CIO. So the only opportunity that um, I had to speak to senior management was quite difficult. And at the time, the Millennium Bug was a big thing. It was something that people kind of knew was around, but weren't really treating seriously. And so if there was no CIO, what would I do? And what I discovered was there was an opportunity to speak to my CEO in a corridor conversation as he came in from work. And I had about 90 seconds to speak to him then, but I realized that it had to be quick. It had to be simple and effective language. It had to create an impact. And that became the basis of how I built my communication uh, strategy to this point forward. And so that, um, that realization back then in, in, in the late nineties then became sort of my mission in life in, in one, some respect about how do we help people communicate effectively? Now, I know that sounds a bit obvious. Everyone speaks, everyone writes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's funny, but we spent so much time learning to read and write in school. We don't spend a lot of time speaking, communicating effectively. There are debate schools and there's a couple of other things where, you know, there's a small minority that might maybe do that. But on the main, it's not seen as a strategic thing. 
Now, I had an additional challenge back then. I'm an introvert. And so introverts tend not to kind of put themselves forward for anything. Um, and I was somewhat insecure and shy as well, which was kind of like this double whammy. And I thought, I'm going to have to overcome this. And so I de developed a little bit of a process. And I'm going to teach you the beginnings of that today to help you understand that. Because I think if you can give yourself a little bit of structure underneath that, it gives you enough certainty and confidence to start putting your foot forward. And then it becomes a mental muscle at that point. Everything's about a mental muscle. So everything you learn today will need to be exercised. It's kind of like doing, um, you know, everyone knows you should eat well, do lots of exercise. Hardly anyone does it. And the reason for that is what you know and what you do are different things. And I really want to encourage you to exercise this practice. Um, it, will, it will absolutely change your world. It transform my world. Um, and so I really encourage you to do that. But before we begin, what I might do is ask you in the chat, if you had a burning question, absolutely what you needed answered today, can you put it in the chat so I can make sure I cover that off? Because I, the last thing I want is for us to get the end, to the end of this hour and people miss out. So maybe put a couple of, if you've got a couple of questions, throw it in the chat and I'll, I'll have a look. I want to make sure that I'm covering that all off. I'll just give you a minute or so to do that. If you're having problems with the chat, there's a chat button down the bottom of your screen. And if that's not working, you can also try the Q&A button. Okay, so we've got uh, a couple of questions coming up already. Thank you for that. I will get to these. I won't read them out yet because it's quite a number. I'll pick the ones that are more common and then I'll, I'll answer those. And then there'll be an opportunity at the end as well for me to kind of round off and make sure I cover these, these other um, questions as well. Oh, I quickly answered the public speaking one. <laughs> How do you get over your fear of public speaking? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Maybe I'll answer that one up front because that became literally my kryptonite, if you will. I, I couldn't... Um, I couldn't, uh, when I got in front of large groups of people, I froze. Um, so there's two parts to that. The first part is that preparation always makes you stronger. So that's a more basic answer. But the other one is really interesting. It's a scientific one. Um, when we go into a, a, a high stress mode, our brain does one of two things. It shuts down or it thrives for the same stimulus. Now, I know that doesn't make sense, but so what they did is they put people in these MRI, MRI machines and they put them through some stressful situations and then asked them some questions after that. And during the MRI machine, what they did is they measured their brain activity, their sweat, uh, their heart rate, their breathing rate, all those things related to stress, obviously. And they noticed that people responded exactly the same to the stimulus. But when they pulled them out of the machine and they said, what was going on? They got two distinct sets of answers. The first group said, oh, my heart started racing. My mind started racing. My hands got clammy and I knew something was going to go wrong. And then the other group said, oh, my heart started racing. My hands started to get got clammy. My brain started racing and I knew something exciting was going to happen. And it was really interesting that it wasn't the physiology that demonstrated that, it was the psychology. And that became known as fixed mindset and growth mindset, which you might've heard of. So for the people who get excited or excitable about when they're about to public speak, go look up Carol Dweck's work on um, growth mindset. It will transform the way you view things. My, my brother is a bit nutty. He, he went, he used to, he's a bit of an extreme sports guy and he learned to ski on, on, on a double black ski run, which is the most dangerous run, most advanced run, on skis that were borrowed that were way too long for him. And he said, oh, this is a great opportunity to learn. And that really, for me, transformed the way I thought about anxious moments. So that became a big part of the way I now review scary moments. Wow, I'm getting lots and lots of questions. Thanks so much. Um, I promise you I'll get through as many as I can, but I, I just want to have a quick scan to make sure that I'm covering all this off. Um, 
sensitivity and diversity is in there, um, doing something online or Zoom, uh, how do you influence, we'll definitely be talking about that. Uh, senior exec communication. I will touch on that. I will do as much as I can there. I actually have a whole nother tool and model for that, but I, I'll write that down so I make sure I've covered it off and I'll cover as much of that as I can. Um, uh, emotional people, people over emotional people. Um, how do you make sure you're managing the energy and excitement? That's a good question. We may or may not get time to do that one today. Um, I have, again have a different model for that. Um, appearing, uh, communicating without feeling hostile or sinister. Uh, how do you manage when you need to speak to people higher up in the hierarchy? Um, how do you say no without uh, insulting or upsetting the person? That's a fair question. We'll do what I can. Um, okay. I've got a great sense. These are great practical, what I call on the ground answers. They're the things that literally happen the moment you're there. And so what I want to do is let you understand that when I'm approaching some of these ideas, sorry, my speaking, I'm preparing in three distinct phases. The first one is design. What am I going to say? What, how do I define that? What order will I put that in? Now that's more structural. Um, it's the stuff that everyone does, and that's where most people stop, to be honest. But it's making sure that your house is in order, your knowledge, your, your, your preparation is in order. So that's the first part. The second phase is how do we adapt? And so adapting is adapting to your nerves, adapting to higher rank, adapting to poor quality sound, adapting to a distracted audience, adapting to different stakeholder needs. Um, that phase is the second phase and there's a there's a number of questions that you've asked that it kind of fit in that bucket and there's the third phase which is the delivery phase which is how do you manage nerves um how do you manage sp very specific scenarios and that's the um, delivery side and that's the third phase we may or may not get time to go deep dive into that but most of your questions are not in there so hopefully it's not a big issue the other questions that are often in there is you know how do i manage my um hands or body? Uh, how do I manage my vocal nerves? What do I do with props? That's in the third phase. And we may or may not get to go deep dive there. But like I said, most of your questions are not in that area. So when I'm seeing these questions, I'm thinking, well, which part of the phase are we working on? And are we getting ahead ourselves? And so what I want to focus on today is what I call phase one. Uh, it's the design phase. It, 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 it uh, eliminates probably 90% of the secondary and tertiary phases challenges. So we'll start with that and then I'll answer these questions, but great, great questions. Let me just sort of start by um, sharing a screen with you because we have a little bit of a slide show here going. It'll be very short. I want this to be interactive. So um, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. But I think it's really important that we have this uh, information in front of us. Okay, so, um, Universal principles of great communication. So the reason I named that is because while this is both important for online, it's also equal, equally valid offline. It's equally valid in email. It's equally valid in a corridor conversation. It's equally valid in a speech. These are the core elements that make all communication uh, strategic and effective. And if we can answer those, uh, if we can prepare for that scenario, we're in a much better place to move forward. And the reason I do that is because we're in a world where it's quite complicated. 20, 30 years ago, if someone wanted to communicate with you, it might be a letter, it, it might be a phone call, or they might directly approach you. And that was pretty much it. Today, we've got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, like all the social gamut. We've got SMSs, we've got emails, we've got mobile phones where we can't literally escape. And so we're bombarded with information. We're bombarded with people wanting to connect with us. And we've got to try and ascertain and make sense of that and still not be disrupted or distracted enough to get our, to get our message done, to get our work done, sorry. Um, so we have this huge challenge that we didn't have maybe 20 years ago. And so what we've got to really understand is how do we manage our online experience? How do we manage our offline experience so that people are, are, are having meaningful connection in a personal way as much as that we can possibly manage it and still cover the volume of information that comes to us? So that's what we're going to sort of explore today. How do we broadly reach that? In essence, though, communication is actually only a function of two things. And it's a function of two things at a, at a spectrum. At one end, 
is relevance. It's the content you have to share. Now, relevance is the domain of information, people with information. So experts, teachers and lecturers. Now, they are remarkable at accumulating and sharing information. They are not necessarily masterful at uh, engagement, keeping, keeping your attention. I'm sure you probably don't remember a lot of what you learned at school, for example. And so while school was excellent for teaching you something, it was excellent at doing it in very short periods of time. The classroom needed to be there. They probably needed to pass a test. And so their vested interest in paying attention was very, very high. So the teacher or lecturer didn't need to be entertaining. They just needed to get the information across. Now, the number one challenge with information transfer today is you can Google it. 80% of what you know, you could probably Google. And so having information expertise isn't enough. And so what do we need to do to make sure that people are paying attention when we've got information? And the second part of that, or the other end of that is engagement. How do we hold people's attention? And the people are excellent at that are people in performing arts, actors, musicians, comedians, um, so, so good at holding our attention. And they have an inverse challenge. The first thing is they're only responsible for us during the length of the play or the song or the gig. Uh, the second of all, they're usually not trained to teach you anything. And the third thing is that they typically follow a standardized format of, of hero's journey or, or, or standard storytelling. Some people know it as Joseph Campbell, um, which I think is wonderful. And I think does amazing things in terms of building um, engagement very, very quickly. The challenge is that Joseph Campbell and story is it's constrained to people already expecting to be entertained or people already expecting to be engaged. So that's the first thing. The second thing is trust is already implied. Now, Joseph Campbell based his methodology on tribes an ancient myth. Now, in tribes and myth, the tribe already trusted each other because the tribe typically was relatively small. Um, I won't go into the science around that. There is some science around the numbers being 150. Um, but uh, the, the scenario is basically if trust is already there, as in we're going to a gig already, we're going to a play already, we're going to a movie already, it, you know, if the trust is already there, they're already open to listening. And the challenge is that that's not always the case in the real world, in, especially in the business world where people don't even know you and they're expecting to trust you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So these are the sorts of things that I really want to unpack with you today, because they're the sorts of things that I feel that uh, we need to sort of be aware of, relevance and engagement, and in particular, the blending of those two. And so that's what the model that I'm going to share with you today is really about. Because all great storytelling, all great communication really functions on three things. First thing is to having great content. If you don't have great content, then I would argue you've got nothing to share. And if, if all content was king, and I don't like that phrase, but if all content was king, then everything you saw on social media would be absolutely relevant and absolutely interesting and absolutely worth consuming every single, single time you saw it. And I, I think the social media kind of proves that content is not necessarily king, especially when it starts to turn into noise. So the other end of the, uh, sorry, and the other aspect of this is context. Context is the reason of why we're in the room, so to speak. You know, why are we coming together? Are we coming together for a class where people expect information? Are we coming together as friends where there's a relationship already established? Are we coming here as a sales opportunity? In which case the, the relationship's not so strong. It, are you speaking to someone more senior than you? What's your relationship with them that impacts their trust in what you're gonna say? Context can, be every, uh, can, can mean a lot of things. It can also mean time of day, like a, a conversation 9 a.m. on a Monday morning, it's easier to have than 4.55 on a Friday afternoon. So, you know, context can be time as well. Context can also be things like medium, like this medium is different to face-to-face, -face. is different to a giant auditorium with a thousand or 2000 people, is different to a small intimate meeting. Um, context can make a big difference. Uh, and especially in those larger events, acoustics come into it, light, noise also become factors, seating arrangement, lighting arrangements. They're all contexts that we've got to be mindful, mindful of when we're communicating. But I think the most important one and the one that gets missed almost every time is intent. What's your intention for connection, connecting with that person? Is it to manipulate them? Is it to understand them? 
Is it to support them? The response that you have to someone who wants to support you is going to be different to the response you're going to have if you know they're going to manipulate you. And sales is a classic example where people feel they might be manipulated. So if they don't trust your intent, it doesn't matter how good your content is. And I think one of the things we've got to address is what is our intention that we want to create and project without saying, I'm trustworthy. I've got the qualifications. I know something you don't, because then it starts to sound egotistical. And obviously, we're trying to avoid that. So getting your intention across without seeing egotistical or self-serving then becomes, I think, the primary objective before they are even open to listening. And so that part of it is really, really critical for communication. And that's the part I think that's missing the most. And so what we're really talking about is the who, what, how, and why of communication in terms of content mastery, in terms of delivery mastery, and in terms of personal mastery. How do you manage stress? How do you manage unexpected questions? How do you manage a challenge? How do you challenge others politely? How do you respond no when you know they're not going to necessarily like the answer? If you have your awareness about how you can respond to their reaction, then you are master of your capability and master of your emotions, which allows you to be more practical, pragmatic, methodical, and strategic with your communication. And I feel that that's a real skill that, that, uh, that, that, that if mastered well, becomes a real superpower. And I don't feel I've mastered that perfectly, but I feel I've mastered it enough to manage the scenarios that I am in. And again, it's just a scenario where you build the mental muscle, you build it to more strategic or high risk scenarios until you're able to handle any situation. So I'm very methodical about putting myself in test spaces and we can talk about that later. We don't have time now. If we had 26 hours, these would be all the tools I'd be playing with. Clearly that's not a, going, to be a problem, uh, going to be a problem. So we're gonna talk with one, which is the intention architecture. Now, even the intention architecture, when I work with executives, takes three days to unpack. So don't panic. We're going to do a micro version of it so you can see how it works and then test it in your, your, in your own world and then build that mental muscle around that. I'll create some opportunities maybe where we can sort of play with this a little bit as a group and then hopefully post this, we can still continue the conversation. Let's talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about the intention architecture. So the intention architecture is really about understanding where your world and their world align. Because if they don't view your assumptions, your values, your, view, your world, world view in the same way that they view it, then the resistance also is going to be challenged. So, you know, um, Democrats and Republicans is a classic example. Uh, sustainability, how hard do we need to go on sustainability? How strict do we want to go on sustainability? Again, polarizing views. Um, and where people, quote, unquote, draw that line in the sand for where they will not, absolutely not give uh, an inch, that becomes the basis by which the conversation needs to start. Now, we can't always ask that up front. We don't always have the time. But what we can do is ascertain or limit the impact that that might have by using an intention architecture. So let's play with this a little bit. The first one is environment. That's where your world meets our world. Now, if I was a marketing person or, or, or organizational leader, I would think about that as the market you're in. Is it growing? Is it contracting? By how much? What is the size? What is the sentiment? What is the growth rate? All the things that are, you can't control, that you need to consider as part of this conversation. If it was an internal conversation, it might be um, how much people know your team how much people know the competency of your team and you in particular, uh, what's the significance of your role in the project overall. So these are the sorts of things I'm, I'm factoring in. <clears throat> and in good organisations or good teams that manage their environment well do two things. They have a strong position and they're able to create a disproportionate amount of attention. So if you think about that, you might talk about um, Elon Musk and his tweets, or you might talk about Greta Thunberg and her ability to capitalise on capturing and captivating an audience. Um, I'm also thinking about, uh, oh, I can't remember the lady that wrote uh, Harry Potter, I've forgotten her name, JK Rowling. The way she answers her tweets is beautifully sublime. And so the way you have this position and the way you articulate it in such a way that, that is seen as elegant, intelligent, strategic, and smart then becomes the differentiator 
apart from, you know, we do this or we do that, which are more functional. So environment becomes a really important part because that's the rules by which the conversation happens. At the organizational level, if you're a brand or you're a senior leader, organization is really around how is your organization brand seen in the market? So when I say Apple or Nike or Tesla, do you have a response to them compared to their competitors? Is there a visceral experience with that brand? Now, if this is internal, it might be, <clears throat> what's the impression people have on your team? What's the impression people have on your department? What's the impression people have on your site or location? So maybe Houston versus New York in terms of ability to get things done. These sorts of things then become internal conversations, but then also position it in terms of, are you on the wrong footing or on a strong footing and are you not? So that's another part. Uh, the next one down, and I see more questions, I will get to them. I'm not ignoring you. Um, so the next one down is individual, which is what's your reputation? What's your thought leadership? What do people think about you before you even walk in the room? You know, are you seen as competent? Are you seen as capable? Are you seen as, as, as smart? Um, these sorts of things where your personal brand then become important then be, you know, sort of uh, become a strategic part of that. So um, keeping in mind that the individual then becomes an important part of that. At that point, you can actually talk about what you wanna say. You know, what's your message? And so the thing is, if they don't trust you as an individual, it doesn't matter what your message is, that's the intention. If they don't trust your organization, then it doesn't matter what your message is, that's intention. If they don't trust your industry, now in Australia, all the banking is, is under a Royal Commission. So no bank is seen as trustworthy at the moment. So it doesn't matter what's happening in their advertising. People are kind of taking it with a grain of salt. So that then becomes a really important part of that. Um, someone asked something about storytelling um, and, and, a, and a long line of storytellers. Thank you, Joyce, I will get to that. It's a really good question. I will we'll get to that. Um, and the last one is audience. Now audience, um, um, it is really around who are you speaking to? What do they need? Um, Cherie, someone asked, is it, uh, there is a recording. I'm not sure what the plans are. I'll, I'll answer, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Um, the last one thing is audience, which is what's their sentiment towards you? What do they know? What are their knowledge gaps in order to you to help you? How open are they to learning? How politically are they inclined to listen to you? From a role or title point of view, do they see themselves above or below you? And that might be in an organizational structure, an intelligence point of view, or maybe even at a personal level, I, I, I think I'm better than you, ego. So audience then becomes the critical piece because that's the bit where the, you're getting down to the individual listener. And a lot of the questions you asked were about how do you manage individual listeners? So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you, like I said, this normally takes three days to unpack with an executive. We don't have that, but I am going to give you maybe five, seven minutes or so to write down a couple of dot points in each of these levels. So what I mean by that, let's start at the bottom. What are two, one or two things you know about your audience? Dot points is fine. What are one or two things that you want to say to them to make sure that they learn something or know something? or influence them. What are one two or two things you know about yourself that gives you credibility or trust? So it might be something in common, it might be your qualifications, it might be your years of experience, it might be you just have a personal relationship with that person. Like what are those two things that you could leverage off? What are two things about your organization if you're talking to an external party? Or what are the one or two things that you about your team if you're speaking to an internal party that you need to be aware of? Now, those things tend to be either political, structural, um, uh, or, or, or social. So political, uh, sorry, so I'll, I'll go through those very quickly. Structural is, I am a higher rank than you, I'm your boss, and therefore you have to listen to me or not. Um, political is more around influence. They don't have a formal title within the organization, but they have a reputation for doing their job well, and you probably don't know them. So distant social. And then, um, no, sorry, distant political. And then there's social, which is how well do you know them personally? You know, do they trust you? Do you have you built a 
re relationship or rapport with them. So they're the three things I'm factoring in at that level that we've got to sort of consider. And then at two things at the environmental level, which is what's the nature of your conversation? Are we coming here because there's an emergency? Are we coming here because we want to? Are we coming here because it's a sales opportunity? One or two things so that I, we can get an understanding of the context of your conversation. So I'm going to give you about five minutes to write something down. And then we're going to play with that to create what I call a micro narrative, which you'll see after that. If you've got any questions, uh, maybe put them in the Q&A and I'll answer them. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to scan all the questions. So many. So good to see all the questions in the chat as well so that I'm covering that off. So um, I'll give you about five minutes. So it's, uh, it's 31, 931 where I am by my clock. So 936 or whatever 36 is in your time zone. Um, we'll come back together. One or two bullet points in each. Just write something down. Nancy Dowd is Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. I'll type it in. Two minutes to go. Okay, we might um, get you to put your pens down for the moment. Now, what we're going to do here is a little bit of an experiment. I'm going to ask someone to share their uh, five points. So here's what we might do. Um, I think I'm just going to stop the share for a minute. I think if I'm not correct, 
we can allow certain people to talk. So um, if someone in the chat wants to have their bullet points used as an example for how you create a narrative, please ask, say yes in the chat. I'll open up the channel and we can have a conversation. Who would, it be like, who would like to be the brave first? Oh, I'm not sure if this is not working or I'm not getting a response because the chat I think is working. So what I wanna do is teach you all how you take those bullet points and how you make a concise, compelling, what I call narrative that allows people to relate to you and your idea in a meaningful way. Okay, so we got Michelle. Okay, Michelle Temple Wong. Okay, I'm just gonna look for your name in the list. Hey, Michelle, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Excellent, I can, I can, wonderful. Thank you for being brave and volunteering. <laughs> Okay, so if it's okay with you, can we maybe start at the top and you share your one or two bullet points so that we can walk, walk through the model from top to bottom? Yes, um, so top would be environment, is that right? Yes, so, yes. so I'll, how about I'll, I'll, I'll call it out and then you can answer the, the, that level, how's that sound? That's probably good. Okay. Because yeah. I yes. realize you just answered the slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so environment, start with, start with environment. Um, can you describe for me again what that meant, the environment? Context. That's the reason why you're in the room. That's the nature of your context. Oh, okay. Okay, so what I was thinking about, I, I'm uh, beginning a startup, and my the context or what I'm hoping to do is provide a message about my startup that will uh, encourage the audience to invest in it. I'm looking right. for investors. <laughs> gotcha. So that's your audience. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Um, can you tell me what your startup does just at a high level? Yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a mobile app. We're looking to solve skincare issues in a, a unique way using data and crowdsourcing that data, so to speak, through a digital platform using that mobile app. Okay, cool. Is that a crowd, a, a public crowdsource, or is that a medical crowdsource? Like, what type of skin disorder is this? Um, you know, it's going to be a public, uh, like a social media app where people can share what skincare products they like or don't like, and um, what gotcha. ones they've had skin reactions to, for example. Great. Um, okay, gotcha. All right, thank you for that. And can you tell me a little bit about your startup? How long has it been around? What's the origin of it? So this, it's, we started in 2017. It originated from a project that my co-founder and I were doing in MBA school. Um, she's had a history of skin reactions and wanted to try and find a solution for it. Um, and this is what we thought of was to start collecting data and use that data that, you know, of, of what other people have found for their skin and right. um, create an AI program that can combine all that data and kind of give people recommendations that, you know, well, these people have had reactions to these type of skincare products. So you may want to avoid them if your skin is similar. Great. And have you got, uh, tell me a little bit about you and your involvement and why, why you got involved with this particular project. Sure, so, um, you know, I've had skincare issues myself. Um, she and I have skin that's very different, but um, my skin reactions have been more because I have oily skin, I have acne, um, I've had skin cancer in the past. Uh, but I, I thought I was excited by this idea because I am a scientist. I have both a PhD and an MBA. Um, and uh, I study data science right now. Um, so I'm interested in being able to apply data to this problem um, and provide this data um, you know, to the general public to help them out. Right, great. 
And and you've you've told me that's the app, so that's your message. I'm assuming you're, you're, this is an app that solves skin care problems, etc. Yeah. Uh, so that would be your message um, in there. And by your description, you've already given me a pretty good understanding in terms of the audience, which is you know people have different responses to different treatments or solutions for skincare. Yeah. And they're looking for something that's specific to them based on objective data because it's quantified data as opposed mm -hmm. to experiment and see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. All right. So I have the five levels here. So if I was to start at the top, and you don't always have to, but I'm going to just, because that's what I taught, um, you can do this out of order. I'll explain that in a second. So it might be something along the lines of, oh, do you have any understanding of how big the market capital the uh, market size of this uh, uh, sector is, segment is? Um, you know, we've done some different calculations uh, based on the fact that it's a, a mobile app, but it's very selective towards skincare. Um, yep. We've estimated it to be about two and a half billion dollars. If you consider, mm -hmm. you know, the data we're collecting, um, how we're applying the AI algorithm, uh, it could also be useful for tracking purchasing behaviors and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So if you're pitching to venture capitalists, they're probably wanting to know a little bit about your scientific background a bit more. They're probably mm -hmm. wanting to know a little bit about your, your, your street smarts and your, and your history of, of building events or partnering with people that can help you, events. <laughs> yeah. Organizations. Um, and partnering with people that can help you if you don't have that direct experience so mm -hmm. that there's a capability that's not being ex um, sort of seen as exposed. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure whether you have had a chance to think about that, but if I, you know, from a venture capitalist point of view, they're the sorts of things that over on top of the idea, they want to know that the, the team has the skill sets and capability to scale this if it happens to be wildly successful. Um, yeah. If it's not successful, you can kind of learn along the way. But uh, if it's wildly successful, would you implode? You know, could you manage it? Etc. And obviously, all venture capitalists want something that's wildly successful. So, yeah, <laughs> um, they're the sorts of other things I would probably include in this little pitch. But I'm going to base it on the information you shared. But I would also add those bits in just from a pitch point of view. So it might be <clears throat> along the lines of um, I'm tempted to do this out of order, but I won't. I'll do an out of order version in a second. So it might be you know. Um, is, is it targeted? I'm assuming, is, is it more women skewed or is it kind of both genders? Did you have any thoughts around that? We do believe that women would probably be the larger market involved. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it might go something like this. With a skincare market as massive as it is, we estimate is at least 2.5 billion. Why is it that there isn't a universal solution? Some solutions work for some people, some solutions work for others, and it always feels like a bit of a trial and error. Now, as a, a, as a person with a sensitive skin, I've had a history of, tri of that trial and error scenario, where one thing worked, one thing didn't. Something worked for my friend, but didn't work for me. And it became this headache. And I thought, surely I can't be the only one having this problem. So what we did is we created an app that quantifies and tracks the skin type, the solutions were uh, available and the effect that it had. It's big data at its greatest. And as a data scientist, I'm big on big data because this gives us literally objective reality about what will work for individuals and individual types. If we could tap into that, what could that be worth to an organization? What could that be worth to a skincare organization in particular? What could it be worth to the market in that they don't have to trial and error all this um, the plethora of products out there. We believe we're on the cusp of a new type of engagement. Not quite personalized medicine, but personalized skincare, a unique focused targeted segment that we can manage, measure and quantify over time to see whether the bigger opportunities are there. So what I'm looking for is for an opportunity to explore that journey, to come with us and see where this could take us. Because I really think that we've really hit a mark when literally half the population is curious about having better skin. Wow. So, so, 
And what I'm doing there is I'm starting from the top and I'm painting the big picture. This is the opportunity. This is what's going on. Then I'm going in the organization. We saw this opportunity. Why not start something about it? Then at the individual level, I had a scientific background, but I also had the skin conditions where it made me interested in this. So this is where you're vested in the solution, Michelle, as opposed to I have my intellectual idea and I'm going to intellectually apply that to an objective scenario. Uh, your message was the app, obviously. And then the audience I'm creating, I'm, a, I'm appealing to their sensibilities. And then that becomes a really important part of the conversation over and on top of logic. Because logic causes someone to know something, but it doesn't necessarily cause someone to do something. You know, like I said earlier, we know we should eat well, do lots of exercise. Almost no one does it. So you know, knowing and doing a different thing. So we have to motivate people. And if we appeal to their sensibilities, then we have a much better chance of, of appealing to their to their uh, broader selves and the solution that can solve. So that's a really good example. But if you did it out of out of order, it might be you meet someone at a networking party, and they go, well, "What do you do?" He goes, "Oh, I'm building an app." It's like, "Oh, what's the app about?" And that's the message level. It's like, "Well, the app's about helping people with different skincare types solve their skincare issues." Well, how are you going to do that individually? Well, I'm a scientist, so I decided to be analytical about this. Um, and then they go, well, you know, because they're the audience, you can ask them questions about them. You know, do you think that would be interesting? Do you see have that challenge all that sort of stuff? Um, and then, then when you've got that attention, you go, well, at an organizational, well, that's why we did it. That's why we set the company up because no one's doing this. And it's a $2.5 billion market, which is the environmental statement. So you can do this out of order. You don't have to be strict with the order, but what it does is it makes sure that you don't have a gap that you're covering all your bases. Because if there's a gap, there's a challenge, there's doubt. And there's the doubt, the answer is almost no. It's kind of like me saying, I'm going to give you a brand new car, Michelle, but there's a one in 10,000 chance that the brakes will totally and absolutely fail. How comfortable would you be with the car? So <laughs> even if it's a new car. So, you know, if there's doubt, there's a gap. If there's a, if, I mean, so if there's a gap, there's doubt. And if there's doubt, the answer is almost no or conservative. And the last thing you want is someone to be conservative with your idea or your message. So our job is if you cover at least one sentence from each of those five levels, then you've got a much better chance of covering the gaps. And if you're covering the gaps, it's easier to build that trust and rapport. So uh, hopefully that was helpful to you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Great. I'm going to sort of mute you and put you back in the, back with everyone else. If someone else wants to have a go, we've probably got time for one more and then I'm going to answer some questions. Uh, let's see, how do I... Um, okay, so I'm learning to use Zoom a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, um, actually a whole bunch of questions have just popped in. So uh, thank you, Claire. <laughs> um, it's a bit of practice, Claire. Claire asks, how is it done? It's just being aware that there's five levels and being aware that you've got to answer at least one sentence in each of those five levels. So I might quickly answer some of these questions and then if we've got time, we'll do one more example. So um, a lot of people said, how do you manage different people with different personalities? <laughs> uh, they're emotional, they're reactive, they're judgmental, all that sort of stuff. So this is where the audience analysis comes in. So I started to talk about this before. Do they have the structural, um, political or social influence that you can impact? So structural, do they think their boss is in charge? The way you manage that is different. You need to manage all the people that influence that thinking and you need to understand how that person works. So, um, political might be, well, who's influencing that difficult person? How could you influence them? Do you have a connection and relationship and rapport with them? How could you work through them and collectively work towards shifting this person's view? And social, what's the nature of your relationship with them in the first place? Do they know you? If they know you, do they trust you? How would you build that trust and capability? What's the practice you can build underneath that? I find that managing personalities tends to be a group effort and it requires being a bit strategic about how you approach that. Some people also like their information very high level. They're not interested in the details. Some people like engineers only like details. And if you go high level, they'll think you're talking fluff. So you've got to be understand what, how do people like to receive their information? 
And the other one, which is a little bit more advanced, and we don't have time to go into now, is are they a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic learner? And there's a whole bunch of NLP stuff, which I don't have time to go into today, that we might factor in. So when you're managing personalities, that's what happens. That also works with groups. How do you influence the group? What's the political nature of the group? What's the structure of the group? How advanced are they in the project? How much do they think you're relevant to that project at that moment in the project? These all become really, really important. So um, they're the sorts of things um, that I'm always thinking about in terms of managing difficult or complicated scenarios, whether it's a senior executive, where it's an emotional person, where it's a person with a personality disposition, I'm going to say. Um, the answer I got about how you be concise, answer one question on each of those five levels. And if you can answer, sorry, one sentence. So if I said, if you had to answer one, um, a summary of your idea as one sentence, what would be the environmental statement? What would be the organizational statement? What would be the individual statement? What would be the message? And then what would be, and who are you speaking to? Could you answer that in one sentence? And if not, then I would argue it's not clear enough. And if it's not clear in your head, it can never be clear in your audience's head. Now, um, so I feel that if you can answer at least one sentence in each of those areas, that's an easier way to be concise. Now, the bonus points are, is can you make that one sentence compelling? So in, in Australia, um, I'll give you an example. Um, I could say in Australia, post boxes are red because all the post boxes in Australia are red. Um, but I could say there's a reason why Australia Post chose red for its post boxes. So the same fact got across, but suddenly there's a reason for someone to engage with that statement. And if you can create a way for them to engage with that statement, you've got a much better chance of building the relationship, building the rapport and continuing to the next opportunity in that conversation. So have a think about how you say it and how you position an idea then becomes really, really important. Um, again, I don't have time to go into detail around that, unfortunately, but there you go. Someone asked about how do you manage Zoom or online interactions in terms of interrupting. Um, it's a little bit two parts to that. Uh, what's the social protocol already in place? You know, what do people expect, in other words, when you're interrupting? Is it hand up? Is it just speaking up? Um, and then also, what's the nature of your relationship? If you have a high personal relationship with them, it's easier to politely interrupt. And so those sorts of things then become uh, things that I'm factoring in terms of managing the scenario. Um, okay. So do you have resources for people to learn in an engaging way, which is a question from Cherie. Um, there's a few parts to that, Cherie. The first one is a psychological one, which is what's your degree of interest in learning about your listener and empathizing and engaging with them. So Sun Tzu said in The Art of War, if you learn to understand your enemy better than know themselves, you will learn to pity them more than want to conquer them. And what he's saying by that is if you know exactly what people do, what drives them, what motivates them, what gets them excited, what distracts them, at what way do they like to receive their information, if you understand the nature of that human being, then you're understanding the nature of that relationship. And it's the nature of the relationship that allows you to build the trust and rapport over and on top of the knowledge or the capability. Because if you just want to transfer knowledge and capability, put it on the internet, send them an email. I mean, there's much more efficient ways. So that's kind of that, that, that um, uh, that's the way I would approach that. Agata said, you know, uh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> how do we friend, win friends and influence people is a classic book. Someone has said, is there any great books? That is a classic book. And I would always go back to that book. Um, there's another good book. Um, oh, there's so many books. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe we can put a little bit of a book list together, but um, uh, I'm a big fan of books like uh, The Science of Getting Rich. And, and I, I, they use riches in a non-wealth way in terms of socially rich, personally rich. It's about how do you add value? And so I would, it's a short book, it's worth reading. It's worth reading over and over again because the more you read it, the more you understand it. And the more you understand it, the more deeper it gets and the more profound it actually ends up being. He's written it in very simple language, almost to the point of being too simple that you don't understand the sophistication of his ideas. So I would encourage you to kind of read it definitely more than once. And you know, books like Art of War, um, Science of Getting Rich, I read once a year. 
And I would go so far as to read different editions and different interpretations. Because if the layout's different, the phrasing's different. And the phrasing's different, the meaning's different. So you learn different things about that same text. So, you know, I'm constantly studying this sort of stuff. So, yeah, fair questions. Um, how do you answer difficult questions? So the difficult question qu answer was really around, well, how do you understand the other person? How do they make decisions? What's their rationale? How can you relate to their rationale? And how can you respond in such a way that's not about your logic, but their rationale? So again, it's about understanding your audience. Someone also asked about storytelling and being direct. So you can be direct and do a story at the same time, but you need to do that five level exercise and you need to do the five sentence exercise. So for instance, when I was, um, when I was learning how to speak to that CEO, I opened up with this at the beginning, you know, I needed to be concise, I needed to be compelling, and I needed to be relevant. And I did that because it was a corridor conversation. And I did that because there was no such thing as a CIO. And the only way I could catch the CEO was a corridor conversation. So there's a short story, but it allows you to understand my logic and my rationale and the history and the context of my thinking so that you can relate to that. And it's really important that if people can relate to that because they might go, hmm, I don't agree with what you just said, but I understand how you got to that conclusion. So therefore I understand that person and why they might say that. And at least if they don't agree with you, they can't agree with your logic or your logic flow, in which case they, can, they have to allow for that. And if they don't want to, then at least they're understanding, well, at least they come from that angle, I can factor that in. And if they're intelligent and they're a decent leader and a decent person, they would be able to manage that through. Because let's be honest, everyone's different. And so people think differently, people react differently, people respond differently, people communicate differently, and you've got to factor those things in. And if they're their boss, they should be knowing that and they should be managing around that, or they're not really doing a great job as a boss. If they're not doing a great job around them as a boss, then you need to build the trust, the rapport, the relationship, understand how that person thinks, and then strategically work out how you position an idea so that makes sense to them. And then they'll start to trust you more, and then they might give you, ask you more questions about, well, what do you think about this? And I think that's an important part of that. Building that rapport might not be, I'm going to get them to agree, but I'm going to at least get them to agree to understand how I think. Then I'm going to get them to understand how they can work with me. And then they're going to understand that I, they know that I'm trying to work with them. Then I can understand, well, what's the nature of this relationship? And you kind of build it that way. So that would be the way I would manage that. Um, let's see if I can answer. I think I've answered the gist of most of your questions. Um, by the way, before we end, this is one of many webinars that Girls in Tech is running. So if you are uh, interested in more, go back to Eventbrite and see a whole host of other events that are running and see if they can help you. I will be doing other events and webinars myself. So some of those might be relevant to you. Um, so let me put up a slide. If you've also got any questions, this is the email you need to um, respond to. And I will get back to you uh, specifically around that. So um, this is... So info at girlsintech.org. If you have any questions, connect with me there. I'm more than willing to answer more questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time to do it properly today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for so many questions. I really appreciate the curiosity and intrigue here. Such a great sense of you know, um, ideas. Let's continue the conversation because if you want to ask, if you try this and it doesn't work, come ask me. If you want to know more about which books to do, come ask me. If you want to try something and it doesn't work and you want to come back to me, come ask me. That's what that email is about. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate you being there. Hopefully it was what you're looking for and we'll see you next time. Thanks.